Hi, so welcome to the second part of lecture one. So in our first part, we talk about development as an idea. And this second part, I want to draw your attention on how people actually implement the idea of development. How are they actually whether actually measure how whether they are successful or not, right? Um, so um, for this, I go back to the Sustainable Development Goals website, um, which I show on the screen now. And um, so let's look at um, some of these goals and see what's the explanation of it. So the first one, I will look at no poverty. Um, so end poverty in all its forms everywhere and look at the targets and indicators. So let's scroll down to look at what are the target and indicators for this goal, right? So let's stop right there. And the example here is proportions of population below the international poverty line by sex, age, employment status, and geographical indicator. So international poverty line is a concept that is developed by World Bank, which is another development actor and we will talk about it later. Okay, so let's look at what is another indicator. Um, so proportions of population living in household with access to basic services, proportions of total adult populations with secure tenure rights to land with legally recognized documentation and who perceive their rights to be secure. Okay, more or less that. So this is some of the example of indicators for ending poverty, right? And then let's look at another goal. Um, how about climate action, which is about climate change, um, an important issue today. So take urgent actions to combat climate change and its impact. Okay, so these are the targets and indicators. Um, for example, proportions of local government that adapt and implement local disaster risk reduction strategy. Okay, so and another one is um, number of countries that have integrated migration adaptation impact reductions and early warning into primary, secondary and tertiary structures. Tertiary curricula, sorry. And mobilize amount of United States dollars per year starting in 2020 accountable towards the 100 billion commitment. So you can see that a lot of um, the indicators here is about number of countries um, and amount of money. Um, so I want you to take a moment to think about this. Um, what do these indicators tell you and what don't they? Um, so these indicators are pretty um, using a lot of um, technical language, mitigation, adaptations. Um, so people who are familiar with climate change will know what are those, but not everyone, right? So first of all, I want to point that out that um, there are a lot of technical terms being used in these indicators. And also, um, these indicators are meant to be easy to measure and um, apply universally. So it used indicators like number of countries with policies and um, um, amount of money being mobilized. And actually, it doesn't really tell us much about the quality of those policies. How are they being implemented? Um, and um, how are the money being used um, to combat climate change? So this is some of the observations of um, how people do development and measure their progress towards the different goals uh, in international development. Um, so anybody wants to guess what is this? Okay, um, so it is actually the World Bank headquarters and it is in Washington, D.C., right? So it's a very fancy building, right? It's a, like a headquarter of a multinational corporations, right? So the World Bank is um, one of the development actors that I want to briefly introduce to you um, in this lecture. So they call themselves the World Bank Group. I also have asked you to explore the World Bank websites in, in your class reading. So you must be familiar with it, right? So um, the World Bank Group says that its goals are to end extreme poverty, um, which they define as reducing global population that lives in extreme poverty to 3% by 2030. 
and to promote shared prosperity, which they um, define as increasing the incomes of the poorest 40% of people in every country. So you can see that these two goals are focusing on um, improving people's income and also in um, improving equalities. So how does the World Bank group define poverty? And the World Bank's definition is actually used worldwide um, by most international development actors. So this is what it says. 10% um, of world populations live on less than $1.9 a day. So this is the newest poverty line that they draw using some specific methods um, to calculate um, and you can refer to the website on the details of it. But anyway, um, this is how they define poverty, people who live less than $1.9 a day. And according to them, 10% of the world population is living under that now. And then it says, um, this is actually an improvement, uh, a significant improvement from 30 years ago, where we have 36% of the world populations living under the poverty line. But the actual number actually, the actual number of people living under poverty actually increases because the world population has grown um, quite exponentially since 1990. Okay, so um, the World Bank Group claims that they have um, funded over 12,000 development projects via traditional loans, interest-free credits, and grants. And then some of the sectors being listed down um, include agriculture, education, energy, finance, health, industry, trade, etc. So development really involves a lot of different sectors. If you remember in the last part of our lecture, we talked about sustainable development goals and there are like 17 um, different goals involving different sectors that um, the development sector is working on. So with all these definitions and indicators for measuring, it seems like the development language can be very technical. So um, that's what I mean by development as a technical profession, right? Um, and indeed, more and more people are professionally trained in this area. So you have degree in development studies, development economics, social entrepreneurship, public policy and sustainable development. So you really have multiple degree studies being offered to specifically specialize yourself in this field, right? So of course this degree is not necessarily available everywhere. So where I come from in Malaysia, um, there is no such degree because there's no foreign aid agency in Malaysia. Um, and the United Nations itself has its own think tank um, called the United Nations University that work on um, revising and criticizing and re um, implementing um, these different United Nations policies. And um, so um, they, they have campus all around the world and they are focusing on different things. For example, um, I, I myself gained a master degree in the Tokyo headquarter of the United Nations University and the degree is a master in sustainable development. But there's also a campus in Malaysia focusing on public health and some campus across Europe focusing on water management and anti-poverty. And then, so we have a group of development experts as the result, right? We're, um, graduating from this degree and working in these different uh, institutions, right? So they include the employees of the UN, um, the foreign aid agencies and um, um, international consultants, right? And to be honest, some of these positions are very lucrative, right? For example, uh, international consultants, they can pay they can be paid hundreds of dollars for each day of their work so typically people fly them in as experts to a country and work for um, a few days to a few months and then they pay them a few hundred dollars per day so it is actually a very significant amount of resources being paid to support all these different experts and you can always see that um the um foreign um, employee, employees 
are often paid much better um, with many folds of income compared to the local employees in this different development agency. So I used to work uh, in uh, the UNESCO uh, in Nepal. And so I was an exception. I wasn't um, employed through the United Nations system. I was working um, sort of uh, with a bilateral agreement with UNESCO. So they pay me with um, um, the same amount of money as they paid uh, um, mid-level professionals uh, in, uh, uh, for the local Nepali. Um, but I was a beginner, so I was I was much more younger. So actually, I still got advantages because I got the same pay as someone with experience as the local, um, um, someone some local people, um, experienced local people. Um, but um, the point here is that um, um, it is a very uneven field. Um, some people are being paid more than the others um, in this development um, uh, technical profession, right? And so who pay for these experts, right? So um, there are foreign aids donated by different countries and they are usually channeled via UN agencies, um, international NGOs and the World Bank. Um, and there are also a lot of charity foundations around the world um, that focus on development assistance, such as um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so this is the UN headquarter in New York, which is again kind of a fancy building like a multinational corporations with a lot of different flags in front of them. And this is the United Nations systems, right? So um, basically, um, those they are most involved in um, the development assistance of different countries are here, the programs and funds. So here you have UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, a really major development actor, which sets the human development indicators, which kind of come up with um, coordinating the sustainable development goals and millennium development goals. And then we have UNEP, United Nations Environmental Programs, and some other things, right? And UNHCR that works on refugees, UNICEF that works on children. So these programs and funds are directly under the General Assembly. Um, so um, all countries kind of participate in these programs and funds. And then we have these specialized agencies, which I want to draw your attention to, um, which involve institutions like ILO, the International Labor Organizations that work specifically on migrant labors and um, local labors and welfare. UNESCO, which I used to work with, that focus on scientific, um, cultural, and educational activities. And the World Bank Group is involved as the United Nations specialized agencies as well. Okay, so basically the World Bank is, even though it's really a huge organization, it is under the United Nations. Okay, so what are the international NGOs? So international NGOs are not related to the United Nations. They are nonprofit organizations that were being established um, by different parties and they are operating internationally to support development aids. So for example, we have um, the Oxfam International um, and then we have the World Visions. Um, so I'd, maybe some of you have heard of World Vision. You can actually adopt children by donating monthly to them, um, uh, sending money to support children worldwide um, every month. So this is a famous program of the World Visions. And then you have Care International. And then you have um, VRAC, which is a less well-known, um, ironically, because it is one of the biggest INGO in the world it is less well known because it is um, its headquarter is in Bangladesh and it is Bangladesh um, Rural Advancement Committee that's the full name um, and it employs hundreds and thousands of employees and so all these international organizations they have millions of annual budgets and so they are they are really big um, organizations. Okay, so now we have um, come to our second interlude. Um, so this is the questions I posed to you to think about before we go to the next part of our lecture. Um, so who do you think should be an expert in development and why? And what are the important criteria of a good development professional? 
Um, so please jot down these answers by yourself or on the Google Doc link share in the Canvas page. So for potential use um, during um, the Tuesday synchronous session, also to help yourself with having something to talk about in the online discussion reflections.